Um, welcome back from your uh, session on food security. Um, just uh, for us to recap um, what we started uh, in the first uh, hour and a half. Um, and for those uh, who like to look at the numbers or figures, projections uh, on the theme of uh, food security and climate change, look at the uh, um, IPCC report five, um, and most, most uh, or the core of the, this issue is located, is placed uh, under the working um, group, work package two, under uh, the term natural and managed resources and use. Um, there is a, a report there which encompasses or discuss most of the issues that we're discussing here. So if you want to have a, a broad framework about the theme that we're discussing today, look at the report um, from a couple of years back, I know, but it's still the, the most valid one, is under the theme natural and resources or managed resources. And, and this is also interesting because uh, the theme of um, agriculture and food security is, is in between several uh, um, themes or issues. When we talk about uh, land use changes, Agriculture is expanding, so it's uh, emitting a lot of CO2 because we are burning forests. So agriculture also has these problems when we expand into new areas. But again, it's how we expand, or can we expand, or do we need to expand, and why we need to expand to occupy more area, uh, especially in South America, Southeast Asia, Africa. Um, just to start uh, and moving a little bit, um, I just came back uh, Saturday from, I have been working in several programs and projects in the Amazon in Brazil, um, uh, working in different systems, especially on what we call bioeconomy interfaces that I was, uh, uh, someone came and asked, and uh, we have been working a lot of um, um, value chains of especially on non-timber forest products, and then also moving into um, a super berry, uh, as we call in Brazil, the açaí. So we are working with the açaí, which is a Brazilian super berry. It's a very red. If you have a, a, a chance, although uh, you're not going to uh, eat this berry fresh, uh, but it's usually frozen, um, similar to a lot of countries uh, in Africa, Colombia, Venezuela, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, which are biodiversity rich countries and a lot of resources comes from non-timber forest products. One of the key products from the Amazon um, that encompasses a truly, I would say, role in food security and providing income to uh, riparian uh, or guys or families that are living along riparian corridors is this uh, palm tree. It's called açaí in Portuguese, right? So it's a super berry because it's very rich in antioxidants and it's, it's a very uh, good in terms of nutrition. So we are um, measuring, understanding the impacts of climate on flowering, changes in phenology, food production, uh, species distribution. So on the, this super berry uh, ecosystem that is very important also for the conservation or riparian, of riparian corridors uh, or the vegetation that is, uh, runs along uh, rivers. So anyway, just came back from there, so I want to share this with you. Um, um, again, it's a totally different landscape than this one. Um, just another comment uh, before you um, return. Um, I will come back uh, to this session on Friday. Um, I will be discussing and participating on the remarks and debate that Chris Kutarna will give to you on um, Friday morning. So I invited him to come here um, uh, to, um, to have a broader, as we are appro uh, 
um, very close to the end of this two-week training program. So we invite Chris to come here and to give you a very broader perspective on development pathways and looking at uh, uh, ways of understanding prosperity uh, as a philosopher. Uh, he will try to challenge you with some of the uh, themes or issues uh, that I'm trying to raise here. So I will be part of the debate in the second half of his contribution uh, Friday morning. Why I'm saying this? Because when I come back here on Friday morning, I want to see that whiteboard uh, filled with your contribution. So that board will be there until Friday. So you have the entire week to draw. I know that, that several of you already made contributions, but if you want to do something else and to do and, and, and use that, that board to be our mural, so then we could uh, look at that as your contribution, okay? Uh, we'll be keeping that until Friday, and then we take a picture of us, uh, your contribution, okay? So I will check, check on that on Friday when I come back. So don't, don't think that I'm not going to uh, ask you to challenge you to make contribution uh, to, uh, to the group, okay? Um, and the next slides, I will uh, zoom in uh, some examples of Brazil, and then I will zoom out uh, from uh, the exercise of design thinking. Probably one of the reasons uh, the agriculture uh, of Brazil is, um, I would say, very important for our economy that represents around um, 40, 38 percent of our GDP. So around, I would say, 35, 38 percent of our total GDP is based on the agriculture value chains uh, or the agribusiness sector. It's not only about the production, but how you integrate um, that into different value chains. Uh, and this is also probably why we suffer a little bit less from the economic turmoil uh, of the past um, uh, situation of the politics and the crisis from uh, 2008. So ag agriculture has been a buffer of the uh, agribusiness has been a buffer for Brazil uh, during the last uh, couple of decades uh, because it has been a very stable, uh, well-developed um, a lot of problems, but one of the reasons uh, about the agriculture development in Brazil is because of the, um, this um, latitude of potential areas that uh, have been deployed uh, by multiple agricultural systems. Um, and, and the deployment of different technologies, as you saw there, it's um, uh, two figures. This is the production, um, and here, area occupied by agricultural land. And I will update this, the figure, uh, in the next slide. Uh, but basically, uh, we are producing more, but this figure is a combination of the major commodities that we're producing here. It doesn't mean that it reflects the diversity of different regions or different places. Uh, but basically, we're seeing a, a curve, a trend in agriculture uh, expansion in Brazil from here. And this is the area occupied by annual crops, annual crops only. Um, and this had reflected on our capacity to feed or to export some of these crops overseas. Um, so... Um, Brazil is the number one in sugar exports, coffee, orange juice, soybean is second. The U.S. is the first one, beef, tobacco. Uh, beef is a terrible example, right, uh, for, for this, for, for us in Brazil, terrible example, uh, misconduct, uh, corruption, and all these schemes. Um, so it encompasses all terrible things and also the expansion of pasture land uh, into the forest. So nonetheless, beef is important. Um, tobacco is also a terrible example. Not in terms of area, but it's uh, incredibly 
I would say tobacco is very important for local communities in, uh, in poor areas of Santa Catarina, for example, that is totally dependent on tobacco production. Although it's terrible for, for us as a societal, it's very important locally, unfortunately. Uh, again, we need to find, and, 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 and in terms of income for farmers, is the best crop available in, that, uh, in those conditions. Um, ethanol, uh, which is the, uh, also the co-product of uh, sugarcane. So sugarcane has three main crops, right? Oh, sorry, products, sugar, ethanol, and bioenergy, and now uh, biopolymers, uh, as you wish. Um, broiler, chicken, right? Uh, um, number one, corn, third uh, in the world. Um, again, um, we are producing a lot uh, under different production systems, but most of these, um, I'd say, products are driven by uh, global demands uh, or the business model or business as usual model to produce something cheap and to export. <laughs> Michael Porter, uh, a professor from Harvard uh, and the guy that has been working a lot on competitiveness said uh, in the early 80s that uh, competitiveness is driven by only two forces, only two forces, which are how can we be very competitive in a uh, strategy to uh, occupy a market? Price, price, not quality. Low price or not price, but production cost. So the first one is produce very cheap, right? So it's cost. And the second one is price differentiation. It, it is sometimes associated with quality, but not necessarily. It's how you market yourself. If you're marketing for quality, okay, it's fine. It's very fair. But it's, the problem is when you differentiate yourselves uh, from uh, a competitor because you place yourself in a position like Apple does with the phone. I'm not saying the other phones are as bad as or as good as Apple, but Apple placed uh, itself in a very specific niche market. Uh, compared to the other ones, just two forces, right? But most of the what uh, we have the uh, capacity of Brazil to occupy the market, uh, especially to be the number one in the most uh, several crops, is because we are producing very uh, low cost uh, feedstocks or, or products. But I'm not saying this is good, because producing very cheap it means that you're not taking uh, all the externalities, all the problems all the issues about water consumption, uh, nutrient depletion, um, yes, all these issues. You have a question? Please, uh, use the mic so we are on TV, by the way. It's about the externalization of the costs that uh, normally we use to, to hear that Brazil has very low prices for this product, but Mostly the um, social uh, costs of the work are not, it's not taking account as well as water and other uh, resources. Sure, it's just because we are uh, going towards the one pathway uh, that is um, not taking into account some of the externalities or especially in terms of social costs. Um, let's come back to this. Um, so, but on the other hand, look at these numbers. 70% of our agricultural production also aims to um, local market. So this is why a lot of companies are coming to Brazil also, because you have a huge, uh, let's say, middle market uh, compared to other countries. Uh, that is um, uh, the capacity of what we call purchasing power of Brazilians Although we suffered a lot from the last uh, five or almost five years of very striking problems with the economy, so that reduces our purchasing power uh, because one political crisis and economic crisis associated with another one and another one. 
so it's affecting our purchasing power. But nonetheless, um, we still have a very um, large market, 200 million people, uh, and that increases the, probably the next speaker, Professor Maria, <coughs> what is her name? Huh? Yeah, uh, uh, Professor, uh, she's there. So she'll say something about what is happening in terms of increasing of our uh, income and impacts of uh, some social policies. So we still have a very strong uh, market. Just to give you a little bit uh, of a, a better understanding of the expansion of, of agriculture in Brazil in the last uh, uh, five decades. Um, the initial or the beginning of a more consolidated uh, agricultural process starts in the south of Brazil in the 60s. Uh, before, uh, we, and we had agriculture before, but as, uh, as a model of production that integrates producers, consumers, uh, starts in the south of Brazil, uh, occupying land uh, here. And then we move the, to, uh, to where we are now in the 70s. So we are start adding new technologies and new uh, uh, solutions. And then in the 80s was a major breakthrough for occupying uh, what we call uh, our uh, savanna-like ecosystems, uh, as we call Cerrado. So this is in the 80s, uh, especially because of um, uh, research and new breeding materials that were developed to occupy or to use that area, um, reducing uh, the area of this ecosystem in Brazil. Um, and then the new frontier started in the uh, 2000, which is the um, new agriculture frontier in Brazil in the states uh, northeast of Brazil, um, and which will be here. Um, and a lot of incursions into the uh, Amazon uh, biome. But most of, I would say, the development pathway of agriculture, uh, especially uh, towards uh, commodities, uh, follow this pathway. Uh, and that leads to uh, the ranking of uh, the third overall uh, production in terms of commo uh, food commodities in the world. Um, first, the uh, US. Uh, who's the second one? You're, you cannot see it, but who do you guess is the second one? Maybe huh? No, the first one is the United States. The, the second one. Huh? Europe. So this is the, uh, all the countries in Europe, uh, the European Union, uh, combine. And then the third is Brazil. So it's basically in terms of a single state, Brazil almost is ranked as second one overall. Um, now, what I'd like to, uh, to start uh, asking you to think um, in an exercise that we'll do in the next uh, 30 minutes um, is to um, think of the context of insights, things that you have to come about to think on issues of bringing a solution, okay? So you're hired by country to solve a specific problem with come up with a solution. It's not a role play, but you have to come with a uh, specific solution. So, and we'll be using one uh, technique um, that I will share with you a little bit uh, later. So basically, uh, when you think about agriculture, as we discussed here before, we, we think about land use, what is the uh, process and uh, how the land is used by uh, a specific uh, region or farmers. But when you design your solution, design to be a global solution as possible, okay? Don't look at specificity of your region. Try to be a little bit abstract in looking at the global lens. Uh, you're hired by FAO as a, as a group of consultants to come with uh, uh, solutions to design uh, smart, friendly climate solution to provide or to contribute to food security, 
okay, as a global solution. Uh, brings uh, or bring the examples or come with examples from your regions, but trying to uh, escalate that. Is it clear? Don't look at the narrow lens of your experiments. Trying to do the upscale and see how your contributions, your thoughts could be upscalable. Uh, the other issue is do we have uh, legal or environmental frameworks that constrains the expansion of agriculture? Are uh, areas which are biodiversity rich or hot spots that needs to take into account? Um, look at the cost and externalities as I shared with you before. Look at water consumption, nutrients, dynamics of pests and disease. Look at value chains. Do not look at a single crop, but how these chains are interconnected. And then finally, look at infrastructure and investments. Usually, we look at all the way around. So we start with investments in infrastructure and instead of looking at uh, the production. So, but look at all these issues together, OK? Don't look at that as a separate ones when you look at the uh, solutions. Um, but we have a few issues. Uh, we've seen, uh, contrary to the curve that we've seen in Brazil, agriculture productivity has been, I would say, stacked uh, or um, did not grow uh, or stopped uh, in terms of uh, the learning curve. So we are struggling to um, continue to produce food globally uh, with increased yields. There are, I would say, uh, areas that still productivity is, is being increased. But on average, globally, uh, productivity has been uh, stopped uh, or stabilized. Uh, the other issue that probably some, some of you guys uh, look uh, also is um, population growth. Can we uh, do something about um, the growth of population and also in terms of food loss? On average, globally, we are losing around 35% of the total food produced on average. Well, of course, it varies in some countries from one country to another one. So despite of produ producing food, we need, or in spite of, we need to deliver food. So we are losing a lot of food in this value chain that lacks infrastructure. The other issue, this is uh, uh, not very, um, good picture of the Brazilian Amazon, uh, where we've seen a lot of deforestation that is encompassing or causing a lot of uh, uh, impacts on our uh, Brazilian uh, reports uh, for the convention, which is uh, deforestation has been a, an issue for Brazil uh, during the last uh, 40 years. So this is a map of the Amazon. Uh, red, you see the intensity of deforestation in the Amazon. Uh, especially driven uh, directly by expansion of uh, pastoral land and then indirectly by other secondary forces. Um, and then we have in uh, light green uh, protected areas uh, in paper, protected areas uh, from different, uh, let's say, frameworks, national parks and indigenous reserves. This is our, uh, I grew up here. Uh, as these two categories of protected areas. Um, so this is another issue. Can we expand agriculture uh, even into other areas? If you're coming from Europe, there is no space for you to expand uh, the agriculture. Uh, but you can have a lot of subsidies to produce. Uh, can we still live in the, this uh, framework with the, is heavily subsidized uh, versus uh, to produce in a competitive basis? So these are the issues that you have to take into account. Because all of us, you said in the beginning, you, you want to have uh, cheaper food, right? You said to me in the beginning, or no. Or you want to produce uh, uh, food with a real price. Or when you go to a supermarket, do you want to pay the real price of food? Or can you afford? Or you're looking at just the cheaper food.
<laughs> oh, so you want everything. So she said she wants to pay, I would say, very low price, uh, quality, that doesn't... Co- So when we're producing organic food, does it mean that we are consuming less water? Yes? No. 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 Because uh, the, the... Okay. Fertilizers? Sure. No. So we have a lot of... Uh, issues that we have to not, I wouldn't say to agree, but take into account. Um, Can you have, um, sorry, do you have the microphone? No, but anyway, he's sitting on the microphone. Be careful. (laughs) Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mining requires some kind of understanding in the Brazilian context, but also when you zoom out of Brazil, maybe you will talk about it. Um, It's about uh, monocropping, monoculture. You mentioned that, uh, actually according to the table, uh, Brazil is one of the largest producers of sugar globally and sugar is a monocrop so uh, how does it contribute or has it contributed to food insecurity in Brazil Um, secondly when you zoom out (coughs) in other parts of the world like in sub-Saharan Africa of course it has and it is one of the global challenges to feminine currently because uh, multi multinationals especially they are involved in monoculture not farms not uh, local farmers per se Uh, the last one is a bit maybe you will also zoom out Uh, it's about land grabbing I don't know whether it happens in Brazil or it's only in the... I will make uh, some calls. Yeah. Thank you for now. Well, he asked um, he ask us, not me, <laughs> ask you, when you uh, start drawing your solution, how can we couple or, or how can we deal with the issue of mono, monoculture? The example that he, he gave, and he asked a specific question, was um, sugar cane as a a single crop, does uh, sugarcane expansion or or does sugarcane plantations affect food diversity, right? Um, So this was his first point, or affects uh, the the capacity of local farmers to diversify. So this is basically a question. The second one is is associated with... um, well, not in, in the order, about land tenure uh, and the um, uh, process of social issues facing um, uh, how communities uh, are being displaced by the market forces and lack the capacity to, uh, uh, to return or to lose uh, the tenure to the land or the uh, because they don't have the title, but they have the cultural, I would say, um, mandate, uh, which is governance over the resources, right? So this is a, a typical example, and uh, social conflicts over land use. This is a very, I would say, good example in the Amazon, where we have um, land tenure insecurity and multi-layer uh, process of um, um, uh, land titles, uh, and it's a long story, uh, but again, there are several areas, especially in the Amazon, where land tenure is an issue. So that increases 
the issue of uh, social instability uh, and conflicts, social conflicts or rural conflicts. Um, and the third point that he asked, I forgot, but I'll ask him again. The other point was m monocropping, oh, yes. but you started with the land tenure, I think, where you are trying to talk about land grabbing in specific. Yes. But uh, my major interest is in monocropping because... For, for commodities. Yes, yeah, for guess, commodities, yeah. because yes. you talked about optimization of land current use. land use, yet we have mono monocropping, global monocropping to crops which requires a huge, huge land sure. to cultivate. Any other comments? You have a comment? Any other comments here? Yes. Uh, there? I don't think the, for the product, the, the sheet pre price is for the, pre, for the producer or their um, agriculture, sure. but for high products is for supermarkets or something or, or, or others, but for all countries, if you send the uh, natural product, the product, then give you um, sh a high uh, products for can or something. And for the answer for what is your name? Alex. 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 I think is a uh, land uh, reforestation, land for more civil culture. And for mono 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 what is the name? Monoculture. Monoculture, uh, it is a uh, political topics because s few people have a power for the land. Perfect. Any other comments there? Uh, thank you, Professor, f uh, for the in informative presentation. I have a comment uh, on the slide: uh, population growth and consumption. You know, I read an article, read an article a few weeks back. It said that the economic growth is 2.12%, uh, 2 .2%, while the population growth is just 0.08%. That means the population uh, economic growth is much higher than the population growth. And the trend continues through the present day also. So why we are always blaming the po population like always consider the poor people with the issue of food insecurity, something like that. I think the problem is with our economy. It is not equally distributed. There is no equity there. What's your opinion about this issue? So uh, again, it's probably my, um, I would say, lack of capacity to encompass all the um, interconnectivityness and being fast on, on my uh, assumptions here. Uh, his point is a very well taken. He's basically saying that um, we cannot blame that food security, all these problems they were facing based on population growth, uh, which are happening or occupying or uh, happening in some countries that are consuming less. <laughs> but the inequality, as we said in the beginning, so inequality or the asymmetric banners of growth and development is also probably uh, challenging us more because of, of these issues that we start probably on the beginning when we said decoupling these two things. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, any other things? Here. And this is going to be the last one because we have a couple of more slides and we still have on the exercise to, to do. Okay. Yes. Good. Uh, only a comment about the transgenic products, maybe can be a good alternative to the climate change. But how this uh, interact with the food security and in the food sovereignty? Because uh, one thing is you can eat wh whatever you do, whatever. In order that you decide what to eat. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, as, as I said in the beginning, remember that there are four pillars of food uh, security as stated by FAO, one of them is exactly what you said. Uh, do you have access of choices uh, that you can make? But if you don't have a choice because uh, a crop or a system is uh, um, displacing the opportunities for local producers to use what they want because they do not have a, an option. Uh, this is 
exactly what is happening in the soybean market in Brazil. It's very uh, rare that you'll find uh, non-GMO uh, soybean in Brazil now. Uh, it's very rare. Uh, and for those who are producing uh, non-GM uh, soybean, uh, the producers are getting a premium of 30%. 30% on a commodity price is huge. So it's huge. So there, but there is a market. Because again, uh, just to illustrate, we're in the process, again, to be more educated, to be empowered in governance of the resources. I don't have the answer, but if we manage to go beyond our own little niches, start working with the others to, to discuss uh, these issues in an open way, as, as our colleague from Chile here challenged me about uh, water consumption. Uh, but on the other hand, she was saying, let's produce fiber uh, and wood, uh, but what are the systems uh, that could be not winners? Because we think in terms of winner and loser, right? So uh, winners and losers, why don't we have a, a middle ground, right? <laughs> yeah, or uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it's op optimization or whatever, but usually uh, we think in terms of winner and losers, but when you think about this, we are all losers because if there is a system that is in operation that we do not have the control to make decisions. Anyway, so this is for you to start thinking uh, on the discussions. Just to give you, I said, uh, some numbers of Brazil, and then I will summarize and I will finish uh, with a couple of more slides only. But this is land use process in Brazil. Um, uh, Amazon biome, 42 million hectares. Just to give an idea about the size, so then you could compare it with your own countries. Um, crops, crops, when I say crops, annual crops, um, which is soybean, corn, wheat, rice. Uh, 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 sorgo, very little. Brazil produces very little sorgo. We try, but. Uh, Pasture land is, is, the, uh, is a key one, because pasture land occupies uh, three times as much uh, crop land. And uh, cattle uh, is, is uh, or the system for beef production is, is where we could have the, let's say, the most striking gains uh, because of low productivity or pasture land in Brazil. Uh, planted forest, as I said, uh, a little bit of uh, pines, but mostly eucalypts. This is the total area. It's a little bit more now. It's uh, almost 7 million hectares of planted forest, uh, which is less than 10% uh, of our cropland. In Brazil, it's 851 eight, uh, million, million hectares. Issues are different issues, productivity, uh, biotechnology, as you said. Uh, uh, can we improve? Um, can we have a landscape? This is a landscape of, uh, I show in the beginning, a landscape in the south of Brazil. This is the, in the northeast of Brazil. It's a fiber production, as you said. I, I brought this new uh, one, <laughs> especially for you. I add this, as he likes eucalypts. Uh, eucalypts, uh, there's one guy from Australia, right? So, um, so this is a, a corridor uh, or an interspace native forest. This is a native forest uh, in the state of Bahia, uh, Atlantic rainforest. Uh, with uh, probably this is, was a well-designed system, one of the best ones that we could have. Instead of uh, cutting the forest, um, can we have um, all these issues together? Um, now going into sugarcane, because someone of you asked about sugarcane. Uh, it's hard to explain, but I will, I will give you just briefly this. We, we used to burn sugarcane before harvesting. So we had to burn sugarcane and then harvest manually. And now 95% uh, of total uh, area of sugarcane is mechanically harvested, 95%. There are still few areas that uh, but burning is not possible, which I'm saying that 5% is manually cut. 
So 95% is mechanized, so there's no more burning. And this um, ban on burning has to be, uh, or was organized and deployed by uh, a legal framework, a legal framework that banned uh, burning sugarcane, which is a little bit more friendly practice. Uh, and I'll come back to you, especially on the intercropping of sugarcane and other uh, possibility to diversify. Um, and another one, uh, success, another one say only success case, Brazil has a forest code, a forest code that uh, uh, it's uh, mandatory by any farmer to have uh, permanent areas protected by forest and um, forest reserves. So it's the unique. So for those who are from countries um, that are, um, or you that are working on research associated with the land use um, modeling. I, this is an interesting topic for research. Uh, let me illustrate. A single farm, a farm has 100 hectares of a crop, or 10 hectares, or 5 hectares. The forest code in Brazil, it's a national legislation, mandatory. I'm not saying that it's 100% uh, fulfilled but it's mandatory. Uh, it's a national framework that says, in addition to have your crop, you have to set aside 10%, 50%, or 80% of your area covered by forest. Are you with me? So if you have 10 hectares, now I'll go for 100 hectares, it's easier to explain. If you have a, 100 hectares, and you own the 100 hectare plot, if you are in the south states of Brazil, 20% has to be covered by native forest, right? Which is called, under the forest code, legal reserve. But if you have a river along that riparian corridor, you have to have an addition of forest of, that is mandatory in the forest reserve. It's called permanent protected area. Two categories, right? So that is a very interesting example of a climate-friendly policy that was not designed for climate, was designed in the 60s for other purpose, and has been, I would say, under severe attack because farmers and the other players are saying, I cannot use fully my land because I cannot make decisions about land use because the legislation is saying I have to set aside 20 or 25 percent. If I am in the central east of Brazil, 50 percent. If I am in the Amazon, 80 percent of the land needs to be covered with natural forest. Are you with me? So if you are in your country, ask uh, your colleagues that are in the agriculture production systems if you have any, anything similar to this, okay? Europe doesn't have. Uh, it's a national legislation. It's called Forest Code in Brazil. Uh, I haven't heard any country that has this similar policy. But the problem is the compliance, <laughs> right? It's a beautiful policy, but the compliance. Um, and one of the, I would say, uh, main goals of the Brazilian INDC. You know what is INDC states for, right? INDC. Have you heard about the Paris Agreement? Paris Agreement. So the Paris Agreement was uh, something that the U.S. totally vetoed, right? So <laughs> but basically, the countries that attended uh, and signed the Paris Agreement, um, they, um, they came with their national goals for um, impacting or affecting climate, which is INDC, right, stands for. Uh, it's uh, Intended National D. You know what is D stands? Huh? Determined. Determined contribution. The contribution of a country uh, towards climate change. And I would say 90% of the Brazilian INDC 
is about um, helping or designing policies for the compliance of the forest code, which is a target of 12 million hectares of restoration of degraded land. So this is basically the core of our INDC, is to support the implementation of the forest code. I'm not, I'm not saying this will happen, but it's basically, if you look at the forest code and the Brazilian INDC, INDC or Brazil uh, present in Paris is aimed towards the compliance with the forest code. But my pledge to you is to come back to your country and, and ask Chile, uh, who else here? Uh, Argentina, uh, Uruguay, uh, Cameroon, do we have a, India, right? If you have uh, uh, any other country, US, uh, so ask uh, your uh, environmental agencies uh, if you have a forest, similar forest code, because it's good to know. The other argument is, can these forest reserves be considered as carbon stocks in the life cycle analysis of a crop? Because you're not managing a crop, you're managing a landscape. Because the forest code, the forest code in Brazil, it's a landscape policy. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, and when we do the life cycle analysis of a crop in terms of water use, in terms of energy use, nutrient use, we're not taking into account that land that is set aside for forest. And we need to take that into account because you're managing a landscape. Again, it's something that we are taking for granted. Probably uh, we could use that in a different way. Are you, are you with me? Is it too uh, specific? Do you understand what I'm saying? So to finish this, this is a good example. I will say this. Before, I would say this is a um, forest, planted forest. This is a riparian corridor because it's mandated. So this is what I call permanent protected area because it's mandated, right? Because there's a river. So this is a typical pasture land because the cattle used to come to uh, have water access here. So basically all this area here, degraded area that should be covered with forest by law needs to be restored. So the Brazilian INDC has a target of 12 million hectares of areas that needs to be restored. But farmers cannot afford this because it costs a lot of money. Do you know how much it costs in terms of dollars for restoring one hectare of forest? Do you know how much it costs to produce one bag of soybean or to produce one hectare of uh, corn or wheat or soya? How much? Just to give you an idea, the average cost of restoring one hectare of forest, average cost, ranges from $2,000 per hectare to $6,000, depending on the species, because you have to restore with the same species that are presented and diversity that is presented on the native previous forest. So you have to, to restore based on a legislation that you cannot restore with the eucalypts. It cannot be monoculture. It needs to be very close as much as possible to the na native forest that occupies that area. So more diverse ecosystems, more species, cost more to restore. This is an example. So then you need to do something. Um, now, uh, let me see if I move to, uh, yes, I will sk skip that one. And just to summarize, this is another example of uh, why I'm emphasizing uh, this, because this is another intercropping with pasture land, eucalypts, uh, in a different countries, <laughs> in different regions of Brazil. Um, so now for the exercise, I will give you an example of a value chain. Uh, sorry. This is a sugarcane value chain. Uh, and I said when you're looking at uh, a solution, don't look at the single solution looking at how sugarcane, the landscape, interacts with other crops, or if we could have organic sugarcane, 
we have in Brazil a very good example of uh, uh, a couple of mills or three mills that are going and moving into organic production of sugar, which is very uh, complex and cost, but it has a long-term vision. Uh, and uh, we have a very well-established uh, uh, brand that uh, uh, place, the brand plays itself as a premium in the market because it cannot compete because the, the mill was small. So on, only larger mills were productive to produce very cheap sugar. And this one, the strategy for these guys to position itself was to, be, was to go organic. So anyway, this is the figure of Brazil now, a very precise figure of sugarcane in Brazil. This is the entire value chain. So we have uh, around 10 million hectares, 480 million tons of uh, sugarcane harvested, mechanically 95%. We have around 280 mills in Brazil, distributed mainly in central eastern Brazil. Uh, 38 million tons of sugar, 27 billion liters of ethanol. We have a very important co-product, it's called bagasse, which is the fibers from the uh, extraction. So it's using to co-generate, to produce electricity. And um, do you know who is the largest single producer of ethanol in the world? Single largest ethanol producer in the world? US, of course. U.S. U.S. Uh, the United States produces uh, almost twice this amount. It's uh, for this uh, harvesting season, the U.S. is expected to produce around 48 billion uh, billion liters of ethanol, almost twice as much as Brazil. Uh, feedstock corn, corn, uh, which is totally inefficient in terms of energy balance, but again, nonetheless, they have a mandate to use ethanol. Uh, and then blending with the gasoline, uh, and then from a single crop, which is corn, which is uh, uh, as an, a consequence of food um, security or availability of corn. Anyway, look at the uh, when you start looking at your examples uh, in your exercise, look at the, the entire value chain, the all the potentials. Uh, we have other products from sugarcane, uh, essential amino acids. A lot of companies, a lot of spin-offs uh, from uh, uh, universities in the U.S., uh, especially after the boom of second-generation biofuels, came to Brazil trying to deploy sugar-based uh, compounds and to produce other molecules, which is going towards uh, biorefineries and co-products from sugar, derived from sugar, or fermentation of sugar products. So a lot of companies, especially... Um, Startups, young startups from the U.S. came to Brazil in the last 10 years, and some of them were successful. Others were less successful in uh, using uh, sugar as a substrate for other products, in including bioplastics, uh, uh, advanced fuels, um, chemicals, fine chemicals, um, uh, food uh, additives. Um, and there were, there were opportunities for getting carbon credits. Uh, now that the carbon market is almost uh, uh, zero, uh, but there were carbon credits opportunities. So what I want to do with you, uh, we still have uh, 30 minutes, more or less. Huh? 20. Uh, so then I, I will see if... Uh, uh, what I want you to do uh, in 30 minutes, they said 30 minutes, uh, uh, in 30 minutes, uh, um, I want to, uh, to think on a process that w would inspire you guys. We had a lot of, uh, say, discussions to inspire ourselves, so we'll skip that. Probably you're already inspired, so i trying to do. You're inspired uh, because we we try to understand the complexities of things. This is how the entire circle. Ha, were you, uh, are you aware or have you used design thinking? Never? Any, any champion on design thinking that could help me? Huh? 
by intuition, maybe some, we will, we'll do something. So um, it's, uh, it's about the context of the problem, which is food security and climate change. This is, uh, you were exposed and you have a lot of, I'd say, inspiration, which is, uh, I gave you insights and context about these challenges, okay? And now you have to come with your ideas, right? So design thinking has three main pillars, inspired, ideas and implement, okay? We are not going to implement, we'll be, uh, and we'll skip this, and we'll focus on ideas. So what I want you to do is to split yourselves uh, into uh, probably, um, we have around 70 people here, 70 something. Huh? Over 100, which is great, so we have, uh, um, ten, 10 groups of 10, okay? We'll split in 10 groups. Each group, each group will get um, a piece of this paper here. Each group, a piece of this paper. Uh, and we'll take, uh, uh, um, I don't, we don't have large, uh, we don't have, um, Use your whatever you have to draw here, okay? <laughs> uh, but the idea is to um, start uh, with a solution that you will draw or you write from a, a problem that you want to solve to an idea uh, about agriculture and how uh, this idea could reach to the market, considering uh, climate change, food security, food insecurity, all these issues that um, we were affected, okay? So basically, uh, in the end of, uh, of this session, um, you'll have your ideas or prototype uh, design here, okay? Uh, in fact, um, design thinking is more than this. <laughs> I'm shortening the process tremendously just to focus uh, you could start here from a problem, a specific problem about climate change that you pick here. If, if the group of 10 decided that the main problem is water, you have to come with a solution about how agriculture and, and water problems uh, will be tackled by your solution in the end, okay? If your issue is about nutrient use, uh, and the impact of nutrients, uh, or if your group think that agriculture development is causing a lot of deforestation, you start from deforestation, the problem, and then you say, how can you still uh, contribute to food security in a challenge that you have about uh, burning forests? And then you have to come with a solution that encompasses or tackle the problem. Is it clear? Yes? So, um, but then your solution, your solution probably could, um, the process, uh, sorry, it's, uh, it's misspelled something here. So you're working groups. The idea is to have in your group one or two guys that understand a little bit about agriculture. There are a lot of people in the group, at least 10 or more. So pick one in your group that deals or works, uh, one person that works in agriculture, okay? That will be in the phase of insight is the, an expert that will contribute with something. And you'll be the ones that will come or, with a solution that is outside the box, okay? The expert is your source of information. Is it clear? It's how we treat the design thinking too, but it's, we are shortening this. Is it clear? So pick one guy that, uh, that is pretending to be your expert, okay, in agriculture. So the second, don't be afraid or shy to express your ideas or to write uh, your ideas, okay? Feel free to suggest and share your thoughts about a solution. So uh, write your, your solution from the perspective of the problem that you start with, the challenge that you think that is most important one. Pick one 
So if you, another group pick another one, probably you'll come with a different solution. But when you think in terms of solution, think in a solution in a much more integrated way. OK? So just to finalize, most of these works that we are doing uh, that I shared with you is conducted by a group of around 60 professors. Sorry, uh, this is in Portuguese. Uh, but we are working um, in, in um, integrated uh, initiative on different campus of the University of Sao Paulo with almost 60 faculty um, in the theme of circular economy. So, and, and agriculture is one of the key, I would say, areas that we picked to, um, to work or to focus uh, as something that needs to be uh, addressed uh, by the circular economy principles. Uh, I know that someone came here before through teleconference and share a little bit uh, um, issues or discussion about circular economy. So, and some of the works that we, I share with you uh, is part of a platform uh, at the University of Sao Paulo agreement with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on circular economy. Okay? So, uh, Anyway, so let's, uh, let's work on this um, idea. So the problem you decide. Come with the ideas and the solution, which is a prototype. A prototype, uh, when we do a design thinking and real exercise, could be a, a drawing, could be a, if you're working in a lab, a maker, a lab maker. You could have a 3D printing of this, could be uh, a paper, could be a policy. But feel free. Is it, is it okay? We still have a few more minutes. Okay? So just uh, move yourselves. Uh, I know this is, uh, the auditorium is not very, I would say, conducive for, for this uh, discussion. But before we go for a break, let's try to work, and then uh, we'll resume uh, in 15 minutes. You have 15 minutes to solve all the global uh, food problems. <laughs> Okay, just 15 minutes, guys. We have a lot of experts in the room. Pick one, uh, one um, sheet, one sheet here for a group. Group yourselves. Uh, so then we move a little bit. Here, here, guys. Guys, you can leave and find uh, spaces outside. But please don't uh, be around here, okay? You can sit here, uh, or you can use uh, the front here to draw on the floor or whatever. Feel free to find any spot, free spot that you have. Yeah, you had started, and then you have to finish. <laughs> you, start, you start with your own. Guys, let's resume. Hey, guys. One, one of the group, who's, who's, who's coming to, uh, where, where is your contribution? I put it right there. OK, so someone will have to come here and just to say, what is the problem, OK? Okay. Right now? Yeah, uh, let's. Uh, after lunch. Uh, right now. Okay. Yes. And so, uh, what what is your solution? The problem is solution. Our problem is that there is not enough land for the growing amount of people to be able to feed them. Yes. The solution. We have many solutions. Okay. Many, many solutions and ideas. Okay. So you have to be. You have uh, one minute. Okay. I can do that. Okay. One minute. Hey guys, let's uh, let's uh, resume. Sorry. Listen, you have uh, you have one minute to no one minute to say your solution. No, your problem first and your solution in one minute. You have to uh, someone will. Okay. Hey guys, uh, you you have uh, you have one minute to. One minute. You have to say, our problem is in the solution touches ABC. 
is up to you, but it, but it cannot be more than one minute. Otherwise, the next speaker will come. Okay. POV. It's a project oriented uh, solution. I, I will give you the reference for this. How do you like this? Time, you can really come up with very very, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's a project-oriented, uh, project-oriented uh, verification. V is to verify is when you. Let me see. Guys, um, please, please, please sit down now. We had a wonderful, wonderful discussions. Uh, I follow the different groups. We have the best experts uh, in the room, of course. Um, but again, what I will ask you to do, unfortunately, uh, we, we started a little bit late. So my expectation was to have at least four hours to discuss with this with you, or even a little bit longer but you have to go for lunch. So my suggestion, so then we don't, uh, we sort of, we compromise a little bit. We have to leave here around one o'clock and come back at two, okay? Oh, we'll, we'll have time. So unfortunately, because it's uh, what the organizers asked me to do. So my suggestion is you pick one person or two, but you have one minute. It's like uh, having a pitch to investor. <laughs> like someone that will have to tell a story, and the story needs to be summarized in one minute. So the story is about a problem that will say our group, you, you don't, you, even you don't have to start with our group, you say the problem is this, and the solutions are blah, blah, blah. Focus on the solution, but it start with just a single sentence, the problem, okay? The problem is, and then start. And do we have um, a watch that say one minute? Okay, one minute. One okay. sec. Yeah, go. Okay, so our problem was sufficient um, access to water for agriculture under changing climate. And the spheres that we considered were the sources of water, um, how climate change is affecting those water resources, and then the human component. Um, and so we came up with three sort of larger spheres of solutions. The first was adaptive planning, which included things like conservation planning on continental to global scales, um, or maybe by watersheds or, or basins, huge drainages, um, improved forecasting, that kind of stuff. And then the second sphere was water efficiency techniques, like rainwater harvesting, um, modernized irrigation, and reduced pesticide use. And then the third sphere was climate smart agriculture. Next group, next. Next, next, next. Next, please. Thank you very much. Keep it this, we'll fix the outside. Keep it, keep it, and we'll, let's go guys. Yeah, thank you. Our problem was water scarcity and the causes we had drought and so deforestation greenhouse gases, water losses, and waste contamination, soil erosion, inequality. So these are some of the causes which we think are a result of water scarcity. So the solutions. Um, okay. So we have many different solutions, rainwater harvesting, uh, efficient irrigation technologies, dripping technologies, uh, soil conservation, uh, restoration of watersheds, like repairing areas, um, soil, uh, uh, decreasing soil tillage, crop switching, uh, putting crops that are more suitable to the uh, ambient where they're grown, rather than growing high use, uh, high water consuming crops in, in dry semi-arid areas, for example. Uh, Agroforestry, more research, uh, on natural fertilizers. Okay. <laughs> and water education is very important. But that's it. Next, next. Thank you.
next. And then the next one is start the thinking. Okay. Hello. The problem is uh, monoculture. The two basic problems, social economical problems like technology changes, uh, migration from country size to other, slavery, wastewater, loss of autonomy, uh, dependency in monoculture systems, and environment problems like soil improvements, biodiversity lost, pollution of soil, water, and air, change of a biochemical site, and the solutions, uh, soil development of, of new approach for sustainable soil and use management, uh, agro ecosystems, prevention policies for the soil and bio biodiversity, uh, water resource, education programs for farmers, crops diversifications, and agreements between industry and farmers. Next, next. Next in line. Okay, our problem was that there is not enough land to feed everybody and the growing population of the earth in upcoming years. There's not enough land. So we had many ideas, but they all basically focused around thinking in the vertical direction, not just thinking in the X, Y direction, but also in the up direction, and coupling different types of systems like aquaculture and agriculture so we can close cycles and not just be using, putting energy into systems and getting nothing in return. That's basically it. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Let's go, let's go. Let's go. We thought of alternatives to solve um, the food loss in the food chain. So that will be local production for long distances, such as we have here in Brazil, familiar agriculture, local consumption goes with local production, um, technologies f to help f um, food technologies, yeah, it's very important for all of all fields, green transportation, because here in Brazil we have mainly trucks transporting all our food, Incenti incentives for small productions and education to improve, because here we thought of eating out of season products is also a problem, could go, yeah, and so Education would combat this problem, and also regulation. For example, in Europe, there is this. Okay, I can't speak anymore. So, but but this is our alternative. <laughs> Next. All right. Our problem, <laughs> our problem is land use and land use change. Uh, do the major driver of land use in the world is food production and consumption. We focus on the supply side, the, I'm sorry, the demand side, the consumers. Uh, currently, we are eating a high intense land use uh, foods, so we think that uh, start to eat uh, less land use uh, intensive foods is a better way to do an, an efficiency, efficiently way to uh, use the land. Uh, through political programs, e educational programs, uh, tax on high intense land use foods, our subsidies to produce uh, less intensive foods. Next, next. Next in line. Okay. The main idea of us uh, approach is related to agroforestry because uh, we think that th this this use of of th the use of this kind of, of approach can um, increase the productivity in so many so many spaces and and we uh, we can uh, protect the protect more the biodiversity. Um, especially with uh, reducing the, the use of, of uh, agricultural inputs and reducing the use of poison, and uh, especially if, if you consider the bees, for, for instance. And, and the one of the things that, that, that I, I 
Well, w one of the things that I, I, I guess for, for, uh, for agricultural um, plantations uh, is to integrate the, the use of this kind of ideas because there are some studies that show that using combining forest with, uh, with normal production, sometimes you can increase your productivity. This is, this is it. Next. Next. Hi. Uh, our problem is the deforestation. <laughs> and the solutions that we map it <laughs> uh, for this problem is manage and recover the degraded areas. Uh, this is a, a specific problem here in Brazil. We had a lot of pasture areas that uh, needs to could be more uh, useful. <laughs> uh, the agroforestry and mixed cropping uh, 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 diversify uh, the, the crops. Uh, ecosystem restoration uh, from APPs <laughs> that uh, pro uh, Professor uh, Weber told us before. The payment for ecosystem services. Uh, here in Brazil, we have a, a nice program. Uh, we are we have some nice results for this 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 problem, and the, we map as the main a main solution. Public policies and legal protection. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> okay, it's over. Oh, okay. And uh, improve it, crop efficiency. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> no. How many more? Okay, guys, next. We have. Uh, thank you. The problem is inequality of food assets. Now, the solutions we prefer is that governments should buy excess crops during the crop, cropping season so that it will be cheaper, it will be uh, bought cheaply by all and sundry later in the year. Then, uh, redistribution of land use. And again, we, uh, we want uh, the development of local crop protection to take the front stage. Also, we, uh, diversif diversification in crop production so that uh, there will be arrays of crops to choose from, and uh, one crop will not necessarily be very expensive. Then uh, adaptation to climate change and variability of the farmers is very important. They should look at ways of minimizing uh, the negative effects of climate change and variability. Then uh, we want uh, changes on food consumption patterns and quantities. Uh, the rich can eat uh, as much as they want and throw, in the, uh, throw away the others without some getting enough, uh, enough to eat. So uh, the orientation should change generally. Then uh, government should provide subsidized inputs or grants to farmers to make farming very easy. And lastly, we want improved food distribution. Thank you very much. Finally, is it over? Yep. You see that we could manage this before 1 o'clock. They challenged me. <laughs> and I said, we will do that. Yes, we can. <laughs> right. um, just a final, oops, I don't know where it is now, this. Just a sec, um, where is this, here. Um, again, um, thank you very much, this is my name, um, uh, my email, I hope you have a great, um, staying here in Brazil, and I have, um, I will come back on Friday. So I will ask the organizers to um, fix um, or to leave uh, your solutions there because you had done a great job, guys. Uh, in less than 10 minutes, you had uh, solved a lot of uh, problems in the world. I'm very proud of you guys, so thank you very much. <laughs>